I marathoned all the Pokemon movies, and now the algorithm demands I review them. But did you notice the distinct lack of 10 second clip medleys protected by fair use law? That's cause Daddy Show Pro now has this loophole where they'll subpoena you within Japan. And seeing as I like to travel there in the near future without getting arrested, I've cruelly recreated key scenes in each movie from memory to complement my trash takes. Starting from worst to best, please enjoy as we slowly pass through your gag reflex. But first, make sure to subscribe because YouTube's user interface is embarrassing and your support helps keep Joyride's engine burning. Number 24, Hoopa and the Clash of Ages. We're all adults here, except for that one really cool kid who's also watching this. Word to your mother, we all know these movies are just cinema-sized toy commercials, but Hoopa eliminates all pretense of art and entertainment as he smashes video game box arts against each other. You'll have a better time spectating an hour's worth of smog and uber tier battles. Hoopa strong! Hoopa tests strength against his Rayleigh missile defense system funded by US tax dollars! Zero rings out of zero. Number 23, Mastermind the Mirage Pokemon. My partner and I debated if this even counts as a movie, and I'm happy to inform you all we're divorced now. It was supposed to be a 10th anniversary special for the anime that canonized all the films, but it sounds more like a 40 minute obituary for the English dub cast. Each actor sounds like they got one take for a 20 minute max recording session to avoid union rates. While the story has all the edginess of that one cool kid who hasn't clicked away to watch Markiplier smash her past video- WAIT WAIT! Half a mu chromosome out of five. Number 22, Giratina and the Sky Warrior! My partner and I did some soul searching and realized we had plenty more to argue about. She thinks Shaman is cute, but I think they're the biggest villain in this series. Say what I will about flat protagonists and chosen one tropes, but Ash doesn't deserve this abuse, man! Is- is this your browser history, Ash? Would be a shame if somebody shared it. Ah, uh, that's really uncool, Shaman! And the audience doesn't either with this overbloated escort adventure that has no clue of what to do with its core parts. The Gen 4 films go hard, but they seriously had no better ideas for literal Pokemon Satan? Disrespectful. One wilted Gracedia flower out of five. Diancie and the Cocoon of Destruction. If Sky Warrior was overbloated, then Diancie is malnourished. XYZ probably has the most universally reviled films, but give them credit for attempting to bring some charm back into this franchise. Princess Diancie is innocently cute, and her relationship with the cast, especially those clumsy, overbearing servants, is generally funny. This film is just so short, and the animation is terrible. If there's supposed to be one consistency throughout the franchise, it's that Studio Oriental Light and Magic throws the whole kitchen sink at their animation budget, but it's not to be found here. One broken heart diamond out of five. Number 20, Mewtwo Returns. And they should have stayed in hiding. Those pesky anime specials disguised as films are back. And this time it was so bad, it actually pulled Mewtwo Strikes back down in my personal rankings. Mewtwo is essentially the same here, but place him in a different scenario where he isn't the antagonist, and you realize what a flat, empty character he is. He pontificates in circles, while his consults rehash those banger lines for the first movie. The two redeeming factors are Agent Domino and Brock saying the drying pan line. That's some evil scheme you had, Giovanni, but I always bring a drying pan. One drying pan out of five frying pans. Number 19, Genesect and the Legend Awakened. Controversial until I educate you take, this has the better Mewtwo. They're more proactive and less naive than the original. The original only monologues about life, while this one is willing to kill to protect it. Still not good, but it's a narrative improvement. Much like Mewtwo Returns, it has one redeeming moment, and that's when James nearly kills all the Pokemon by firing a rocket launcher. Team Rocket indeed. One rocket launcher out of five. Number 18, Zorak in the Master of Illusions. We have now reached the bare minimum for Pocket Monster based entertainment. Emphasis on the based. Though if you're watching chronologically like a masochist, this is where the series actually begins to decline. It's not remarkably good or bad, but as goofy as its clairvoyant corporate villain played almost too comfortably by Sean Chamel is, he is a rarely distinguished villain. Like, why are the previous villains even evil to begin with? Cause they don't use the governmentally distributed and clearly wiretapped Pokeballs? If there's only one truly memorable thing about this film, it's the message. F*** the Corpos. Two wiretapped balls out of five. Number 17, Qrem versus the Sword of Justice. If you think I'm one of those low-class Anitubers who's gonna siphon the last remaining drops of clout out of Duncan on Bikminyana, you would be correct! 
His voice takes you out of what would otherwise be a wholly inoffensive action adventure. If you want to self-destruct your career and retroactively tarnish every project you're in, do it the old-fashioned way and make anime parodies. Two touching swords of justice out of five. Number 16, Destiny Deoxys. If I didn't lose you all on that last entry, surely I have now. But hear me out, though, sleeping with autoplay on. <laughs> You awake now? Good, now listen. That opening battle is iconic. Unfortunately, the rest of the movie is so dragged out and boring, and on such a cool invasion concept too. And the character who's afraid of Pokemon in a society that revolves around them? Much like Sky Warrior, this had the ingredients for something great, but just doesn't know how to carry them through a theatrical runtime. Two and a half alien orbs in love out of five. Number 15, Jirachi Wishmaker. <laughs> the Gen 3 films are so lucky they were animated on black paper, it's like the main reason I ranked them on the higher end despite Max's presence. They're so visually striking and I can't visualize that appropriately for you guys without serving time in a Japanese prison. Don't let the kicked Vic joke scare you, show pro. I'm actually promoting your movies. I think the majority are worth visiting and revisiting for fans of animation. But what's bad about this movie? It focuses on Max. I don't like Max. Thank Arxius Jirachi is there to provide some desperately needed charm. Three wishes out of five. Number 14, Arceus and the Jewel of Life. Wish I had used my Jirachi wishes for a get out of jail free card cause the god of old pokes got the god size animation budget. Unfortunately, the story can't keep pace with those 60 frames per second explosions, but it's a valiant effort with great stakes that actually connects to the previous films in this gen. Yeah, the gen 4 films were a trilogy and of course I watched them out of order. Fuck. Oh my gosh, that's your voice? You're the god of all Pokemon and that's the voice you're going with? Aw, uh, that's really uncool, shaman. Three jewels of life out of five. Number 13, Black and White Victini. The greedy capitalist Sean Chamel inside me loves this concept of two films with slight cosmetic differences to justify buying two tickets. My partner and I also agree that it was Ash's turn to torment a mythic Pokemon. The big flaw, however, is that there is a massive chunk of plot missing. This takes place in Pokemon's version of the United States, and some characters, most notably the deuterotagonist of this film, are clearly indigenous. This power source that he wishes to control is clearly a metaphor for oil pipelines, but somewhere in the writer's room, they removed an appropriate motivation to communicate those themes. Because I assume they didn't want to make Thanksgiving awkward for the families that saw it. Damn shame, this could have been one of the greats. I invest in dragon energy. Three and a half gallons of oil or dragon energy out of five. Number 12. Lucario in the Mystery of Mew. The only mystery is why this one tops so many lists. It's overrated. We all love Lucario. Some of you sickos more than others. Those rascally Reggies are quite the charmers. Mew is always a welcome addition, and Sean Chamel isn't Vic Mignogna. But much like the other Gen 3 films, we have great ingredients that just don't add up to a satisfying whole. It's another escort story, but in reverse. And for every good piece of storytelling, there's a greater plot contrivance to dampen the experience. Like Victini, this is good that could have easily been greater. Three and a half out of five. And number 11, Mewtwo Strikes Back. The OG. Who would have thought four kids could have founded a licensing giant without adult supervision? However, I regret to inform you, my dear guys, gals, and non-binary pals, that Mewtwo Strikes Back is carried by nostalgia and an incredibly strong opening act that was cut in half for American audiences for being too existential and based. These are the only two redeeming factors that the remaining film coasts upon. Ash's death is not sad. You were projecting a much needed catharsis upon your parents' failing marriage. Just ask our one cool kid viewer who returned to tell you how most of this is lame and commercial by today's standards. Soundtrack still slaps though. Three and a half licensed compact discs out of five. Number 10, I Choose You. The first film in the reboot series modernizes and recontextualizes, that's a word that I wrote in this script, Ash's earliest journeys in the anime, and frankly, improves upon them. Verity and Sorel are far better companions than any of the previous, and Ash is actually forced to grow and understand the metagame for once. There are some odd moments and diversions sprinkled about, but for the most part, this is probably the best movie to reclaim a lost fan with. I mean, it really panders to them, doesn't it? Three and a half rainbow wings out of five. Number 9, Pokemon Heroes, Latios and Latias. 
This is one of the most fun and memorable Pokemon movies for better and worse. I watched this with a large group of friends and that greatly helped in its favor. Amazing Italian influenced setting and soundtrack, charismatic new characters who bring high stakes and crushing consequences, and Annie and Oakley are relationship goals. Also, Brock and Mystery stay out of the way so Ash can do his thing, though they really should have stepped in before he really did his thing. I wonder if all the torment the legendaries put Ash through are Arceus' punishment for this moment. Three and a half soul dues out of five. Number eight, Secrets of the Jungle. It's no less original than James Cameron's Avatar. Ash and Pikachu are for once cast aside to focus on some solid familial drama between new characters Coco and Zarud. Reason see bias be damned, this is OLM's best looking animation to date, complementing some slick fight sequences. Pikachu cuts a mech in half with a freaking lightsaber tail, bro. Also monkey musical. Three and a half bananas out of five. We have now entered the genuinely good territory, where irony no longer carries the bulk of the fun. Ooh, oh no! The lack of jadedy reverence is making me lose control of my hand! It's slowly clicking away to the comforting dulcet tones of Nuxtaku screaming racial slurs over an uncompressed microphone! Worry not, fair viewer. Just for you and only you, I'm certain I can squeeze in another Vic Bignana joke. Number seven, Volcanion and the Mechanical Marvel. I warned you an attempt at charm succeeded in the XYZ series, and here it is! North Korea's favorite bear, Mike Pollock, plays a lovable hardened mythic who's too old for Ash's bullshit, but has a soft spot for his bimbo girlfriend, Magirna. The heart, charm, and slapstick humor in this movie will warm even the coldest Pokemon fan's heart and have them buying its hokey steaks by the end. This movie saved my marriage, and now my children won't have to pretend it was any sadder than it actually was like Mewtwo Strikes Back. Four soul hearts out of five. Numero 6, El Poder de Uno. An unapologetic crowd pleaser. It has something for every Pokemon fan, whether they're invested in all of its elements or only one of them. Ash and Misty shipping is not my thing, but it's there if Mirage Master wasn't enough, you masochist. The legendary battles peaked only two films in, yikes. But most importantly, this is the only one that properly utilizes Team Rocket. I don't understand why they waste time and budget putting them into these movies if they don't even care about them. But in this one, they have an arc. They have the best lines. They are the moment. Two out of five troubles, but make them double. Number five, Pokemon Ranger and the Temple of the Sea. All right, it's poor man's castle in the sky, but if you're gonna cheat, you may as well cheat off the smartest kid in class. This is a well-paced, feel-good, swashbuckling adventure from start to finish. And it delivers on consequences without cheaply abusing the death trope like most of the others do. It's not perfect, though. Manaphy makes or breaks the experience, as I believe this whole movie makes or breaks longtime fans of the series. Haters say it's too silly, I say, have you seen this franchise? This is like the expected amount of silly. If you're considering a marathon too, I highly recommend you watch this one first before committing to see if you're even on its wavelength. 4C puns out of 5. Oraceon stays on during sex. Do we have to use the peg tonight, Alice? <laughs> Get this Wacom tablet out of my hands. <laughs> Dark Rye is a banger. Alright, alright, I'm done. I'm lying. Darkrai is one of the few Pokemon movies that keep you invested from start to finish. The titular legendary isn't a temperamental asshole like most of the others in this franchise. He's a misunderstood antagonist that you learn more about through the different perspectives of some equally charming new characters. And they all connect to some grand, potentially and literally reality-shattering consequences. To top it all off, we have one of the most banger soundtracks in the series, and it actually connects to the plot. The best track is performed by one of the new characters that she puts my tongue game to shame by playing it all on a leaf. Four Oraceon leaves out of five. Number three, Pokemon Forever. Mysterious and homoerotic, just like the old country. Forever is a beautiful film with a great vibe. You could also say this one ripped off Princess Mononoke, but I'd wager this is rather Pokemon's Call Me By Your Name meets Time Traveler's Wife. I thought Tumblr was just doing its Tumblr thing by projecting a romantic relationship between Ash and Sammy, but upon this rewatch, I have to actually agree, subtextually it is. To think this bisexual king grows up to become professor and slam his old flame's mom, what a twisted wrinkle in time indeed. Get me a blue power eat, bro. Ooh, sorry. Just drank the last one. Four and a half blue power aids out of five. Number two, the power of us. Ash and Pikachu are at their best here. 
They're not even the central focus of the plot because it's an ensemble, but their no-bromo antics and how those impact other people's relationships to each other, their environment, and the magical creatures that inhabit it really gets to the core of what makes this franchise so great. Fun fact, this is the only movie to be animated by another studio, Wit, and they completely ripped off a plot point from one of their other characters from another anime they were working on at the same time, After the Rain. Highly recommend that one if my Professor Oak joke from before didn't completely offend you. Four and a half lumberry smoothies out of five. And without further ado, as if it was in question, number one, Spell of the Unknown. It's been my favorite since I saw it in theaters as a wee lad. Remember movie theaters? And it has held up immaculately ever since. There is not a contrived ounce of fat here. Molly and Entei are the most charming and understandable antagonists in the entire anime. And for once, give Ash and friends a legitimate motivation to pursue this adventure beyond the mythic Pokemon of the week is cute and the world is ending or somebody's turn to get tortured. The story's tone is authentically darker too, as is the production design. It's got this melancholic gothic storybook vibe throughout. It's as beautiful as my art on this video has been ugly. Five on no, not a five. Thank you for watching and not reporting my ass to the anime police. I don't typically do reviews like this, but I got surprisingly passionate about this project the moment I came up with that twist. If there's other stuff you'd like me to review in this format, or if you're just straight up appalled by my slander of this children's franchise juggernaut and have your own rankings, fire away in the comments below. And keep on dreaming, schemers. Peace.